And this is Vine Sauce. I'm here with Edward McMilton, creator of Ultra Veggie Man, The Shining of Balzac, and the Attic Compilation, which is his newest... Oh, wait. Oh, that was the... <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So, yeah, tonight we're going to be chatting with Edmund McMillan, as you're aware. And um, he's actually drawing at the moment. <laughs> Ever the pragmatist, he is in the middle of a drawing. So, tonight we're going to be talking about pretty much, I would say pretty much all of this stuff. Hey, Ed. Hello. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, man. Uh, we're live already. All right. I got. Oh, I I shall tweet. Okay. While you're tweeting, I shall sheet my pants because this is really exciting. Is it? I, it is. It's it's very exciting to make sure. Would you say? Would you say I I would say that I'm I'm live with Vine Sauce or live on? I guess it would be on. Yeah, on is on is good. Honest, honest sounds correct. Yes. So and I yeah and I've tweeted. Thank you, sir. Um, very nice. Anyway, you guys know who he is. So um, how are you, man? How's everything? I'm good. Um, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, recently, uh, uh you, the, the the creator of Fallout, um, what did this like live. I don't know exactly what it was, but he like said my name, which was like insanely awesome. Um, and like Brian Fargo was like, and any developers like, I think he actually called me Edward McMullen. No, Ed Edmund McMullen. McMullen. Yeah. McMullen. Oh. Yeah, but I, it was still awesome. Well, we we know you're Edmund <laughs> McMillan, and we we know what you've done. Um, we're all fans. At least I'm. Uh, my name is not Refines, <laughs> or Refines, or Refines. It's. Edmund is, I still is, I still don't even know the man's name and I've I've I've, I've slept with him many times. <laughs> <laughs> Re oh, it man. was refried beanies for a long time. Tommy refried beanies. Yeah. 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 That one's easy. I like beans. Um, but but hello. Uh, hi. Hello there. Um, I hear Danielle. T hello, Danielle. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Good. Um, well, I mean, you know, I guess we can start off with something I thought was really interesting, and that's the um, the shop. I really like some of the stuff you guys are putting out. Thank you. Um, Danielle loves killing herself to get I the shop to I'm filling out customs people. forms right now as you guys are talking. I kind of figured, yeah, I read some of that stuff. It said you were a little backed up. But um, it's been going well for you? You've been enjoying making this stuff? Yeah. Cool. It's cool because, like, it's really neat that, like, I'm putting stuff in a package that something that Ed made, something that I made, and then something that my mom made will all be in one package, so it's pretty neat. Yeah, and I don't think many people realize that, like, all the all the hard toys, like, all the figures, figures in the shop mm -hmm. are all actually, like, handmade, molded, painted, and everything by Danielle's mom, my mother-in-law, Anne. That's awesome. And she's actually making a living. Like, she was able to quit her job and just do this. So she's able to make a living off of just what people purchase in the shop. The chat loves that. And she's she is a fucking machine. Like she made a dead baby and then she showed it to us and then like the next day she sends us a picture. It's a Steven. Like she's look crazy. It's pretty exciting. It's also I mean she's she's always been really good, you know, art wise, but it's crazy to see her like it's like um, I don't remember when it was, but it was a long time ago. And she's like, I'm pretty sure I can make molds and, and make little figurines and stuff. And I'm like, I wonder if you could do something for one of my games. And it just seemed like almost an impossibility. It's like, like it was fun to talk about sure. what happened. It's just like the, the the idea of you know this. This is you're not your mom's not ancient, but she's an, no. she's an older person. She's fifty something. And and she's just like, oh fuck it, I'm gonna learn how to make toys. And uh, molds, and I'm gonna actually I do just, them all myself. Yeah, and then the like the very first figure, the very first figure that was Isaac. Mm -hmm. Like we thought that was awesome, <laughs> and then now what she's done now, like it looks like it just doesn't look like a person didn't even make it because it looks too like symmetrical. And yeah, it, it's gone from it's gone from her making her very first toy like in an eight month period, making her very first model and and mold. 
to doing this like stuff that looks very very, very professional. Yeah, very designer toy. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's what I noticed, and um, and like I don't know if you've seen yeah. the Doctor Fetus, but that thing is the most complicated thing ever. Yeah. I'm like, actually. She actually has to do full molds, so like everything's usually. I'm going off on this right now, but everything is usually like one solid piece. Like Meat Boy's one solid piece, but in order to Doctor Fetus, since he's actually in a transparent jar, like so she has to do a mold for the jar, a mold for the lower body. A mold for his act, the actual fetus inside the jar, then a mold for his hat, and a mold for his monocle, and they all have to go on. And then she has to like, you know, lacquer them up so they're all, you know, stuck together and, and smooth. It's totally nuts. And then she's got to sand the bottoms and everything so they stand correctly. Yeah. But there's a lot, a lot of work's involved. But it, I mean, it looks great. And uh, this, I'll just add one more thing. It's so funny. She's so into all the games and like knows everything and. She's telling me that she she told me she wanted to make a Steven, and I said, "Okay, what did you look up?" And she said, uh, "I googled Steven from Time for Cook." <laughs> <laughs> but then, okay, so she's making the saws, and my uncle was helping her like sand stuff and paint stuff, and he got this idea of what he was gonna do, and he was going off on his own. And she's like, "No, you don't understand. The saw is going through him." <laughs> yeah. Not just splatter, it went through him. So she's just like the whole like philosophy, the theory of the boy. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, great. The saw blade should look like it went through meat, so it should be completely bloody at one point and then splatter from then on with with it turning, you know, because there's logic of the turning, so it's gotta go with it. And he's just, you know, splattering paint he's everywhere. Just, he's, sure. He's Buster Bluth. <laughs> he is Buster Bluth. It's great. I'm actually streaming. I'm actually showing everyone the, the pictures of this stuff while you're talking about it. It's it's pretty cool. I like I really like the detail on this, though. This is this is professional quality the, stuff. The series that she's working on right now is like, like Doctor Fetus is the most complicated, but like the series, the the Isaac series that she's doing right now are like really going to be really, really, really amazing. Like she's only only done the Dead Baby and Steven so far, mm -hmm. and I just posted them on my blog. They're not going to be for sale for a while, but the goal is to have uh, the Dead Baby, Steven. Isaac and Kane for the, um, for the first run of of them and and possibly maybe little like trinkets and stuff. Yeah, she just she just left a minute ago and she was like, I can't wait to do Brimstone. <laughs> I'm an insane person. <laughs> Brimstone is going to be awesome. Oh, that is wonderful. Those forms are going to be fun. Well, that's great. I mean, I Aww. love that. Um, I might end up actually picking one up at some point, so I have a little piece of the um, McMillan family. Are there, are there any toys left? <laughs> Is there, there's dark, but brownies are all done? Brownies are done. But there's meat boys left? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I might, I might pick one up, but, um, and then, you know, show it to the stream and maybe make little, like, scenarios with the meat boy and maybe have them, like, make love with the Dr. Fetus. I don't know. I'm crazy. You've got to play with them. <laughs> I will. <laughs> now, speaking of playing with things, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually, while this interview's happening, I'm going to start now. I'm going to be doing all 10,000 clicks of AVGM. Oh Jesus Christ! Yes, while we're while we're talking, I don't know if I'll make it the whole way, but I'm gonna try. So it usually takes. Yeah, I, I actually had to do it, legitly. The joke um, is that game is awesome, and it's exactly my kind of game. No, you're not supposed and to. And I ever... wouldn't. And I wouldn't pay to buy more clicks because I want to click it, and uh, I like working for my things that I don't need. <laughs> Fair enough. I, that, that is an amazing game. Yeah, it's, you have no, we act. Me and Neil got in arguments um, over. Over uh, Farmville and Pet, Pet Society. Society and a few others, um, but the conclusion always came to like I don't care what you do, but please for the love of God don't pay for things. Right. I don't care what you do, but I'm very disappointed in you. But I'm very disappointed <laughs> in your actions. But yeah. Well, this is what I want to talk about now. The basement collection. By the way, Ed, I want to thank you again for that copy. Um, you know, it's it's been good. I've been playing it. I've been streaming it. I just completed Spewer. Um, and I mean, I guess the point of this interview is to learn a little bit more about these games and, you know, tell you how I feel about them. My favorite is Aether. Um, that was really important for me because, um, as you know, my mom passed away just recently. And, and that night I was playing Aether and the music and everything, the emotion really, really calmed me down and got, you know, got me out of it. Um, that one was just fantastic. And then Spewer carried me through. And um, I love that game too. That was really, really good. That might be my favorite one, gameplay-wise. So, have you, yeah. have you played through Time Fuck yet? I'm about uh, 65 to 70 percent through, and uh, I'm I'm still working on it on stream. Yeah. 
Nice. But that one's also very quality. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit. Which which game would you say is the one that you'd like to start talking about first? Because I know it's hard to choose I, a favorite. I talk about whatever. I mean, with Spewer, it, there's like sadly there's not much to talk about because it was it was done in really short amount of time and like it like I had to scramble around to get it done because I was working on a few other games that I needed to try to get finished before I worked on on Meat Boy and uh, Time Fuck was one of those as well. Okay. Um and I don't remember much like sadly. Just like, a I quick... don't remember much of development. Okay. He was so wasted. <laughs> So, all right, time, uh, time fuck though. Let's talk about time fuck because that one seems to be the one that most people were talking about before I, I, the basement yeah, collection I think came out. Time fuck is, I mean, Ether and time fuck are my favorites, but time fuck I think has climbed the ranks over time um, and feels more. Uh, something more. I'm, I'm a little. I'm not. I'm not like I'm more proud of it, but there's some. There's something about it that withstood the test of time for me, which is pretty hard to do because I usually end up hating everything that I work on. Like, I'm like, I can't stand it, I don't want to look at it anymore. Sure. But there's something about Time Fuck that felt like it just, I don't know, there was just something about it that just lingered. It has well, aged well. Like it's the most, besides either, it's the most, like, refined down to simple what you want it to do. Yeah, it, the, yeah, it's like, true. It's kind of all over the place, and then it has the story at the end. 1,000. You're 1,000. Yeah. So. I'm surprised I'm not hearing you click. I actually thought I was going to have be have to have to hear you actually click He's the mouse. Been clicking Listen. The whole time. Oh, I can hear it now. Yeah, microphone. I, I have it. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say Time Fuck is, is one of the most accessible, one of the most playable. Um, now, how did you come up with... When, when you come up with these concepts, do you come up with the gameplay first, or do you kind of doodle and see, like, oh, well, these characters can work in this kind of world with this kind of gameplay. So how, how's the process of figuring out how you it's, want the game to play? It's really different, like, per game. Um, like, Time Fuck came out of, you know, a friend of mine online who, like, had a really... He just he, wa he was actually a fan. He wanted, he wanted to show me what he was working on and, and just to see what I thought. His name is William. And he had this game where you were this little bat mm -hmm. and you could, like, flip dimensions... And I thought it was really, really cool. And he was like, "Do you want to, you want to help me, you know, turn this into a game?" Because he didn't know where, what direction to go with it. And I'm like, "Yeah, well, let me see, you know, what, what, what I can come up with." And around that time, I had my, uh, to like, ten year high school reunion, mm -hmm. and that like, kind of broke my brain in a lot of ways. And it was kind of like, um, I, I went there and, like. Part of me, it was I was at a weird point because Meat Boy had actually started development-wise, okay. and we had gotten in like Nintendo Power. It was the first time I'd ever gotten any kind of like really large mainstream magazine, and I had I had the the magazine in the car because for some I, at some point, if, if someone was going to be an asshole, I, I wanted to go and get it. I don't know, like well, I, the I don't. Girl from, the girl okay. from the reunion is a bitch. She was a bitch in high school. She is a bitch. That's what we <laughs> like, were thinking about. Part, part, part of like me going like I, in a lot of ways I was crashing it. I, I didn't pay. <laughs> we, we we did not. We refused to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and the major the girls that were throwing it were all huge bitches. And one of them like the main one actually I remember her it just I can't get it out of my brain. I I walk by this classroom and they're working on like. Um, yearbook or whatever okay. and they tell me to come in and they asked if I wanted to do because I was I, I had volunteered some art for the inside cover of the yearbook and they asked if I wanted to hang out or whatever and I said no you know I, I just want to go home okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she goes you know you're gonna you're gonna need to learn how to like be social and, and hang out with people or you're gonna fail at life and I remember getting really pissed off about that. That was very rude. And, <laughs> and she was the one throwing it. So there was, like, part of me that, you know, wanted to really crash this thing. And, and I, you know, I, I kind of had bad intentions going in. And I get there, and it was just the most sad and depressing thing you People could ever imagine. People were already just so wasted. Like, yeah. Like, we got there, like, 
half an hour after it started, and people were just fucking almost blackout drunk. Like, they were stumbling everywhere. I can't stand and that. It, and it was just... it was, There were people crying. Like, you know, because yeah. everybody's like... Has, they've gone through divorces, they've had kids, and all this other stuff has happened. And, but for the most part, everybody seemed to be exactly in the same place I remember them being back in high school. And it was just so bizarre to me that, that it just seemed like everybody came to the conclusion that they were stuck here and that there was no way out. And like, it, like, they, like someone put a box around them and, and they were just stuck in this box. Mm -hmm. And they, even though the, the door was right behind them, they just couldn't turn around and put the effort into turning around and going through it, you know. Instead, they just accepted the fact that they're doomed. Wow. And they gave up. And it was just disturbing. Yeah, and I kind of went. I kind of went back to to work, and this was when I was, I was just starting on Meat Boy, but I was also still working on uh, Gish, um, uh, with the guy that I'd worked with for years, and I had basically done. I'd been gone every every day. I'd gone into work to work with this guy. I was paying for rent there. We were working on stuff, but nothing was getting done. It just went. It went sour years ago, and it was just dragging on. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna make a game about perspective. I'm going to make a game about people like being kind of stuck in a box because in a lot of ways, the guy I was working with, it seemed like he was stuck in his own self-imposed box. Sure. And then the more I was thinking about it, the more I realized that I had put myself in this box too, where I was limiting myself. Like I was accepting my fate. I was accepting the fact that I was going to be stuck here and I, I didn't have many other options. Um, this was like before Meat Boy had any kind of real sure, deals or anything. Sure. And and I mean, I didn't. We didn't think Meat Boy was going to be much of anything when we were working on it when we started. Um, so it was kind of like it helped me realize that I needed to take my own advice. Yeah. I guess and and be more critical of my own my own box, my own self-imposed box. And uh, that's the conversation I was having with myself with Time Fuck. Most of the games I, I do are basically me trying to solve some sort of problem like so I'm, I'm exploring some aspect of myself that I want to figure out and that's what time fuck was that's what inspired it and that's what it was about and it was kind of like uh, you know a story about a guy who puts himself in a box like literally he puts himself in a box and he's his own worst enemy yeah and his his he has these future selves that are just dooming him and, you know, if he chooses to just stay in the box, he can just live there miserably for the rest of his life, or he can, you know, put in the effort to change his perspective on things and find his way out. And that was, that's basically what Time Fuck was all about. Um, now, I don't think many people got that, but that wasn't really the point. It was, it was more just I wanted to, I wanted to do something where the design had some substance, like what you were doing had some meaning with the story as well, right? Um, and uh, that's—I think that's why I like it the most. I like the character too, and I—I and I, I like the whole idea of having you know the villain be yourself, essentially. Yeah, the, you know that's the stuff that you don't really. When you're playing a game, you play it for the gameplay, but you're always in a constant dialogue with this mysterious fellow in the box. And you're always kind of, you know, aware of some kind of impending something or other. And you kind of just gave me a whole new perspective on it. So I'm not done streaming it. I sh when I, as I keep going, it's going to keep getting more and more interesting. Um, I think one, yeah. one of the things that, yeah, that, that really drew me in, especially with the character, is the idea that, like, the, the realization, like, through the game, it's very blatant that you are your enemy it's you but you forget about it you care you you turn like steven is every single steven every single steven in the box is steven right but yet you you refer to the bad one as steven um because you're the player or whatever oh, right and uh, it's kind of odd and, and and also you know interesting and fun to have like an enemy that is essentially you you know the bad version of you um your bad side or whatever and it it's basically separated itself from you, and it has become its own character, even though it's still you. I don't know. It was, there was a lot of paradoxes, and and at the time I was interested in that as well. Um, I did played with paradoxes in 
in um, Isaac as well. Sure. But well, even though um, some people, like you said, might not get that the first time through, someone in the chat just said, um, time fuck makes me really nervous. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's weird, but I think that's a success as a game developer. Um, and it's the music, too. There's something really catchy, but also really, like, I don't know, uneasy about that, about that yeah, song. Yeah, it makes me so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, so the thing about the music, too, so I, went, I, went, I really went all out with, with theme, like with, with Time Fuck. Not theme that would come through for everybody, because they wouldn't know the backstory of why I did what, but just rich in personal theme. Uh, the guy that did the music was my best friend in high school. I actually searched him out. He did experimental music. I explained to him, about, you know, told him all about the reunion, explained to him the game that I wanted to make, and asked him if, he, if he'd be willing to, you know, do music for it. And he understood completely what everything was about, and the music was based off of it. Um, great music. I really, I really love his music a and lot. And he'd kind of gone through the same thing. Yeah, and he'd gone, yeah, he'd gone through the same sort of thing, too. So... It was it was this cool marriage of 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 both art forms and uh, yeah it was it was just it seemed appropriate to you know go into this with somebody from that time you know that was associated with what kind of inspired I didn't even it. Think about that. Yeah, interesting. You're so, you're so deep, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was really fun. I had a really good time doing it, but also while doing it, it it was a. I was at, like a horribly weird time. Like Danielle remembers this. I like I was. I tell you how depressed he was after that reunion. It was like uh, he had to seriously work through why why do I have this life and why do other people have that life? Like what what did I do to deserve this good thing? And there and. Uh, it was a weird time, and it, and it wasn't only the reunion. The reunion was just like kind of a wake up. It was, it was the whole thing I was going through, like the the years that I was stuck in that office, and the relationship that I had with the guy that I was working with for for years and years and years, and being really miserable, really depressed, and coming home every day, you know, you know, thinking that I had absolutely no future because I had no other option other than to the kind of work with this person. Sure. And um, I was losing it. Like <laughs> a lot, a lot of a lot of the game's undertones of insanity were based around how I kind of felt. I was pretty sleep deprived then too. I was having a lot of sleep issues and a lot of anxiety issues. Um, I, I was going through a lot of like agoraphobia at that point where I wasn't really able to go anywhere outside of my comfort zone mm -hmm. without, you know, having panic attacks and everything else, and um, I would write about it. Like, if I'd wake up and my palms would feel really warm, there was, like, this really odd sensation when I, if I wouldn't sleep, you know, get a few hours of sleep every night, oh, my palms I, would get really warm. You know what else? Hmm. What? That you were, he, something was picking up a radio station, and you oh, were yeah. like faintly hearing a weird radio Yeah, it was, and while, so while I was working on it, I didn't know this at the time, I thought I was losing it. <laughs> I was hearing voices, <laughs> I was hearing people talking, like, really softly in the background. And then some days passed, and it was because I had just gotten new speakers, and they weren't um, secured. I don't know what it's called. Like, insulated? They're, wires have to, like, radio, like, frequencies can be picked up really easily by open wires, I guess. Yeah, that happened like, with my old amplifier for my guitar. Yeah and, yeah. We, yeah, and we lived really close to this radio station. And that became a major part of time fuck the whole station change yeah you know you know the, the sounds and the radio in the background um all that stuff kind of bled into the game there's just a ton of different things it was coming from all angles i mean that's usually the best like when i know that maybe something i'm doing is special is when all these things from reality starts they just push in and and they stick you yeah know, when, when when they come out um, I'd like and, to mention uh, I'm over halfway with AVGM. Just want you to know. Uh, you're gonna do it. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, on on a similar note though, with the radio frequency, just something I just remembered. You helped me remember. I I used to record a lot of music in my room, and I had this old shitty amplifier, and it would pick up the radio noises the same way that you had just mentioned. And um, while I was writing this ridiculous song. 
um, I, there was a psychedelic section, and I remember I was I was listening to the amplifier, and it was that sound of the radio pickup, and I just left it in the, in the recording. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I, I I like that. That's that's really that's a really nice story. Um, it's 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 good when I mean, honesty is what makes art art, and I think when stuff falls in from reality, it feels so genuine and honest. It and I think, you know, it, not everybody picks up on these things, but I'd like to believe that you know, in your subconscious, when you're when you're looking at something or experiencing something that's artfully done, um, that you pick up on the underlying tones and all the little special honest pieces and bits and pieces that, that are that are put into the work that that just feel right. Like there's no way to really describe it other than it like it feels appropriate, it feels right. Like just like when you picked up the the, the radio frequency in the recording yeah. and left it in, it's just because it felt right. Yeah. You're particularly I mean, good at that though, Ed. Um, a lot of your games th that stuff really shows through. Um, Ether in particular, I know you spoke about in Indie Game the movie. Um, you said that one's pretty, pretty close to your heart. Um, yeah. And that one, it's just you can tell there's all kinds of stuff going on, and most of it being straight from the heart. So, tell me what you know. Tell me about that one. That one I'm really interested in. That one was another really quick one. I, I made that in two weeks with with uh, Tyler and. It was shortly after. Well, actually, was it be? It was after my grandma passed away, wasn't it? Yeah. So w what had happened that year in 2008? My um, my grandma, who I was basically raised by, was had been terminally ill for years. Yeah. And she was those one of those type of people who just kept, you know, you'd get the call. It's like, oh, it's time. You know, everybody come over, and the family comes over for the last day with her, and then. She'd get better. Oh God! You know, and the months would pass, and then she'd get worse, and then it'd be another one of those things. And this happened for years. My my grandma was just like such a strong, like strong woman. Yeah. And she just, you know, fought for for years to just stick around. And she, um, she, she was a diabetic, and I mean, she had a lot of complications. Um, but she lived. She how old was she? Eighty. Eighty three or eighty four. One of those. But. In 2008, she finally did pass away, and it was this... I, I'd gone through re really rough patches. Um, years prior to that, my, my stepdad, who I was really close to, passed away as well. Uh, he had cancer. Yeah. And um, that was horrible. A horrible, horrible experience where I felt like I had no closure. I felt like it was abrupt, and I didn't expect it, even though he had cancer. Like, yeah. He was dying, but it still felt... I, like it felt like something was taken away from me and, and I and the mysteries of, of death weren't like nothing was answered like I had less information than I went in with yeah. and and I felt like someone was just torn from us and and I, I was upset and I kind of just kind of went into a downward spiral and I you know uh, wasn't good and didn't do anything for for many years and then when my grandma passed away though it was this different event where I actually saw her die. I was in the room when she passed away, and it was it was just such like a an amazing experience because it wasn't scary, you know, and it wasn't it just wasn't all the things that I thought, yeah, you know, happened to you know my stepdad when he passed away. It was just you know a, a drift a drift away, and. Uh, you're hitting kind of close to home right now with this stuff. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about, but yeah. it's, it was just one of those things where... Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, uh, hey, <laughs> you're, you're talking to the right person at the moment. It was such a different experience than, than Dusty. Like, it was ex exactly the opposite. She was at home. She wasn't in pain. But we got to talk to her, we got to lay with her. Um, I think anybody that goes through somebody dying of like a terminal illness, you kind of like, we kind of knew what was going to happen with grandma because the first time with Dusty, you were so in denial and you kind of think they're going to get better. And I didn't realize this whole time, every all the doctors and the nurses knew we were going to die and we were just like, we all thought he was going to make it. 
Yeah, it was weird. You're com- and you were completely in denial. I had these just weird hang-ups of not being, not being there when it happened and all this other weird stuff too, but with my grandma there was this kind of closure and it was like I, I was finally able to get over the previous death and it was kind of just like a bizarre wake-up call to me where it was like I need to, like, my grandma always backed me with everything that I did and she was always my biggest fan and biggest supporter and like she always said that I was going to, you know, become someone great. Yeah. And, you know, I did what I could to show her what I could do before she died. But after she died, it was just kind of like this kick in the ass where it's like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Like, I, it was when I got real with myself and, and said, you know, me saying that I've tried my hardest is complete bullshit. I hadn't tried my hardest. That was, that was a lie. You know, that was, I was, that was a complete lie. Like, I had not even come close to trying my hardest when it came to just being productive and succeeding and learning you know and after she passed away it just felt I just felt like invigorated like I felt like I had something to prove like I had something to to kind of show her that I'm not wasting my life like I'm, I'm gonna do something with you know the time that I have here yeah and um, it was that year that I made like I made Meat Boy I made Ether I made um, Grey Matter I made Coil that year the beginning of that year it's a very productive uh, it, year yeah VGM um, and the map pack and uh, a few others, and then at the year after that, I made time fucking spewer. But it was just like, I just was done, you know, lying to myself and and telling myself that I was trying hard enough because it wasn't true. I had I had not even begun to try. Yeah, I'm but still not trying. <laughs> It was just that point, like that turning point. I mean, in being 28 uh, at that time, it's like around that time when you're getting closing in at 30, you kind of like get to that, what am I doing? You know, that point of like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, what what do I want? You know, and you got to get your goals straight and, and figure out what you want. And that year was a, just a really big year for me. And and, and um, it, I, I had a lot of it had to do with just the energy passed to me you know, by my grandma's passing, and uh, it inspired a great deal of stuff. And one of the one of the most you know significant significant things was was ether. Yeah. Um, and you know, around that time, it was it's one of those weird things where like, I I of course never experienced it until this point when I lose somebody in the family. But I mean, I've lost a lot of close people. Like my grand my grandpa died when I was really young too, and it was horribly traumatizing. Um, but I never had it where someone left, but someone came in. So, like, my niece basically replaced my grandma. Like, she came in, and she was this new person in the family that I got to be really close with. And spending time with her, um, like, kind of brought me back to when I was little. And, of course, losing my grandma, like, she was always there when I was little for me. And uh, I remember doing just lots of creative things with her and reading Calvin and Hobbes. And, yeah. All that stuff, She's and a, uh, yeah. and it, it just kind of like I wanted to make a game about it while it was there, like while while those feelings were fresh. I wanted to see if I could make a game that felt like how I felt when I was little, or at least how I remember feeling when I was a little kid. Um, it was cool, just like seeing it, Acacia, my niece, learn and how she learned and the things that she liked, and it it just brought back these like memories that were buried that you don't even think about, like these feelings and memories of when, when you were a little kid, and, and it, they were just so fleeting, like I felt like I needed to, I'd grab onto one and I'd scribble something down, like a drawing or, or a phrase or, or something on a piece of paper, and I'm like, the more I caught, the more came. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and have all these ideas, or I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have all these ideas and I'd have to like run out and, and you know, get on the computer and start working and, it was like a windfall of inspiration, I guess you could say, when it came to how I felt when I was little and, and you know where I was when I was little. And again, it was another conversation where I wanted to explore what made me who I am, mm-hmm. and you know the best way for me to do that is to actually you know do something creative with it. I think that's a that's a really good answer. Um, it's like, uh, I think John Lennon once said, it's like trying to catch mice in um, something like, if you turn the lights on, the rats go back into their 
into their mouse holes or whatever. Like yeah. that's that's what it's like in the middle of the night when you have that idea and that inspiration and you have to be careful not to lose it. But it's it's maddening. As as a musician, as a guy who wrote songs, I kind of have the similar feel. But I, I really can't relate too much. And the only way I can relate is by playing your games. Um, and right now, obviously, I'm playing a game that you made as kind of a joke and as a statement about the current gaming industry. <laughs> um, 8,561, 8, by the way. Um, in there. Yeah, so... I wanted to talk about the price of the basement collection, if um, if you don't mind. Sure. Four bucks. That's a that's a that's a steal. Um, yeah. You want you want to hear my my logical breakdown? Would love to. So the original game idea was going to be I was just going to I was going to spice up and kind of revamp three games, and put a bunch of extras in, and it seemed to be worth three dollars since it was three games that I was revamping. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Tommy found out that he could actually. He had the old FLAs for, for Grey Matter, and he can kind of soup that up a bit, too. And um, I said, okay, well, then $4, since four games. But then it kind of just ballooned, as, you know, everything does. And uh, I just didn't raise the price from four, because it seemed like... It just seemed like Isaac was five, and this wasn't as good as Isaac. And I didn't spend as much time on it as Isaac, so it seems like $4. But I mean, in a lot of ways, it was it was a way for me to kind of give back to all the people that, like, helped me get here. Like, it pains me to think that, you know, one of the most significant games that I, two of the most significant games I've ever made, Ether and, and Timefuck, I made with these two really great programmers who helped me greatly get to where I am. And, and you know, all they got in return was, you know, $1,000 from a sponsorship. It seems kind of lame. Yeah. So I thought I would be able to give back and... Basically, I only take 30% of the, the profits of, of the basement collection, and, and the rest go to the, the programmers that, that worked on all those games. And uh, a, a more sizable chunk goes to Tyler, who also put together the whole collection and did um, also program AVGM with me and, and Ether. Right. So it was, there was a lot of reasons to do it. Um, I was, I'm also kind of at this time where I... You know, I'd like to. I want to take the opportunity, all the opportunities that I can, and I'm also trying to. Bur I was trying to burn away some time. Like I needed to work on something because t the engine uh, for the next three games that Tommy and I are working on uh, was still in the process of being made. So um, the deal I made with Tommy um, after the initial Binding of Isaac situation, which you know, in all reality, in all actuality, like Tommy should have made, but wasn't able to for whatever reason. Um, I, I told him I wouldn't work on any new games <laughs> until the engine gets finished. So, uh, we, uh, instead I just revamped old games and uh, did an expansion for Isaac instead. Um, but the cool thing is is the, the engine is finished now and we've got two games fully in the works and uh, one in the back burner uh, and uh, they're going to be awesome. I just had a great idea. What? I don't know if it could be a comic. What? Edmund McMillan's home for wayward programmers. <laughs> <laughs> I take them all all in. And you have like a bonnet kind of? Yeah. <laughs> dress. I can see it. Someone here someone here would draw that. That is wonderful. Somebody, <laughs> somebody do that, please. Someone draw Ed with a bonnet in the home for <laughs> one more time, Daniel. Wayward programmers. Wayward, wayward. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um well you're a generous guy, Ed. Um, you know, you're generous with your time as evidenced by our last interview and, and this one. And you're also generous with um you know, like a, like you said, you're only making thirty percent from this game. Um l let's just take that a step further. What I'm a socialist. I'm like Obama. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the real question what's what is important about giving, um, for you? What what does it mean? to give? How, what does that do for you? It makes me happy. I mean, I... You know... Few, you know, I, I'm very happy when I when I work. You know, I'm, not, I'm not the happiest person in the world when I'm not. I mean, Danielle can vouch for me. If I don't have a project, I'm not happy. Okay. <laughs> um, and I know how hard it is to stay happy. 
You know, life sucks, and people are fucking horrible. You know, let's face it. Like sure. people, people are are broken animals who do horrible, terrible things and don't care about anybody. And you know, I like to give back as much as I can and as much as I'm able, um, because I feel like I've been dealt a really good hand. Um, and I like it's one of the reasons why I like to talk about, you know how the process and, and how I got here and, and everything else because you know if I give one thing to anybody is that you know I'd love to give the ability of them expressing themselves artistically and, and, and how much happiness that brings me I know you know to be able to share that wealth would be amazing um, but you know it's not always possible so I do what I can other in other ways you know, sure. and, and I, I try to I try to put myself out there as much as I can to people who you know, who need information that I might have or whatever else, and I, and I try to keep my stuff cheap and, you know, realistically, if you can't afford it, I don't care if you steal it. Um, it's not a big deal to me. I'm not really losing any money, and I don't believe that piracy actually affects that. Um, but uh, I don't, you know, I, I, tr I try to be as nice as I can because I know how hard it is, if that makes sense. It it does. That's that's where the price point comes in, as we mentioned. The the five dollar Isaac price point, the amount of value you get from that and, and even this, the you know, the extras, the time you spent. I remember when we did our first interview you were scanning um all the like drawings and some of the old stuff that you had. And now like when I when I see the basement collection, when I take a look at it, it's like, oh man, you know, that's that's just nice. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just for the fans. And well, it's, uh, I mean, that, love that's it. also mostly like having, like, I just want to treat people the way I want to be treated. I mean, I kind of put that, you know, to work and whatever I'm working on in the same way of like, if I want something that's a special edition of something, I want it to be really cool and I want it to have as much as they possibly can offer. And I've been let down by special editions of games. Yeah, a lot, and uh, you know, I, I like to just if I have the opportunity to do something where I feel like people might, you know, there's a small amount of people that might really like this, I'll totally do it. You know, I'll I'll totally I'll totally go the extra mile because now realistically, it wasn't fun scanning those pictures. No, but, couldn't have been. You know, the the end result I think was pretty good, and uh, it was it was you know burned away some some hours. Sure. Um, I guess that works for me. I mean, I get I get to reap the benefits as the player. Um, and, and you know, I actually, oddly enough, as I play through this, I don't give the audience everything while I stream. I, I actually show them about you know half of the bonus content, and I say, look, you know, just grab it if you want to see the rest, because that that to me that that's my way of saying, go out and support a developer that you love. Um, yeah, totally, and I, and I appreciate it greatly. Like, I just, I just got through um, doing a, a post mortem, which was painful because I just was in a rut, I guess, and I couldn't really write. But it took like a month. <laughs> yeah. I wrote this really in depth post mortem, and I'm still editing it um, for Game Developer Magazine. And uh, one of they always ask you for things that went right and things that went wrong. And I firmly believe that the number one reason why Isaac succeeded on this insane level that it has. Is, is, you know, people like you who stream. Like, sure. it's like, Isaac had a really bizarre life cycle where it started out low and then, like, six months after release started building and, like, ended up in the end, like, you know, eight months into its lifespan, you know, it's, it's selling what it sold on the first day, yeah. every day. You know, and that's just insane. And I was trying to figure that out, and it's like the only the only thing that I could tie it to is the fact that with with the sales came just a just rush of people who streamed, you know, did let's plays on YouTube, sure, sure. did fan art and everything else, and it's really like it's the fans that picked this up and just carried it. And and I you know experienced that on a on a smaller scale with with Super Meat Boy. Um, there's it was just. With Isaac, it was a different fan base. It was just like more, I guess, more people that just felt like the game was made specifically for them, and and of course, the made was the game was made to stream really, like because you can stream for forever and get different results. But I think there was just something that 
clicked with certain people who identified with some aspect of the game and really put it out there and and I'm sure the price point you know didn't hurt I like the barrier of entry to be small sure. but uh yeah I mean I as I greatly appreciate people streaming and all that stuff it's fun I I, I honestly I watched I guarantee since release of Isaac, I've definitely watched more hours of people playing than, than I you've played. played. <laughs> for sure. It's way more enjoyable. Yeah. Like especially seeing someone play for like the first time. I saw this this stream of I think it was like uh a, a, an Australian stream. I don't remember what it was, but it was this guy and this girl and they had both never really played it before. The guy the guy had like seen it, so he got the basic idea, but she never played it and it was like it was crazy because I was seeing these people experiencing it for the first time, and like I hadn't experienced that since release. It was, and it was, it was kind of cool to you forget, you know, why people like stuff. You know, right. you get lost in it. And like Isaac, right now, it's hard for me to look at because I just hate it. Um, but <laughs> when I see it through other people's eyes, like through fresh eyes, then I can love it again. You know, and then I can appreciate it again. And uh, and really, that's what sells it, I guess. You know, seeing that that like kind of magic in in other people playing. Um, yeah. Totally, dude. Um, and that's well, you know, you have to make a good game in order for it, you know, people to want to stream it. And Isaac was a very, very, very replayable game. Um, and and so is so is a lot of the other stuff you've done, really. I mean, for different reasons, for like score and skill and challenge. Um, but Isaac, you know, the roguelike elements worked to your advantage, and um, I have to thank and you. And again I learned, for that. and I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a great deal from that too. Like everything's learning experience. So with Isaac, I really learned more of like what people kind of appreciate and what what works to make a game replayable and everything else. And and uh, both projects I'm working on with Tommy right now, we're both going all out to like really make these things infinitely replayable and a lot of random generation and stuff like that to just keep it going forever and they're you know one of them is super meat boy um which we're playing around with uh some some pretty cool stuff with score and stuff like that that would actually i think people might appreciate cool and the other one that we haven't announced yet which is secret um is totally weird and uh i think it's going to be very out of left field and no one will expect it cool but, it's very fun, and we're both very into it. So you heard it here first, guys. Unexpected. Weird. That sounds like the stuff we like on Vine Sauce. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> It'll be just... interesting to see if people... I don't even know if it's something that... I mean, yeah, I guess it could be streamed. But, yeah, no, it totally could be streamed. Oh, it's yeah. just so weird, though. You don't even know. Like it's, it's... Just, It is fucking amazing. <laughs> and there you go. Danielle likes it. You guys are going to like it. Oh, someone in the chat said Coil 2. Fuck yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, be it. Uh, that's that's one that no one can stop streaming right now. Oh God, yeah. Can't get enough coil. <laughs> somebody figure out how to go to the next phase. <laughs> uh, hey, I've done it a few times. Um, <laughs> by the way, someone in the chat just said, "I love his wife." Uh, so. I love her too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Here, we actually talk to her for a second so I can go to the bathroom. Sure. Yeah, I would love to. Hello. Hi, Danielle. Um, I was on, or we were talking to, um, I don't know, oh, Jesus, um, <laughs> a Lethal Frag the other day, you know Lethal Frag on N Twitch? No, I don't. We actually, we used Twitch for a little bit, and then we stopped, so. Okay, so, yeah. well, somebody in that chat said that I sounded, well, first somebody said that they couldn't stand my voice, and I was like, oh, okay, and, um, which I... I know I have a very strange voice. And then somebody said that I sounded like Bart Simpson, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> That's not true. It's not true. Someone said you sound like Mel from Flight of the Concords. Oh. But hmm. like a normal uh, version of Mel. <laughs> like without a little lisp kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Like just a, you know, a, a pleasant, a pleasant Mel. I always thought I had a really low voice, but then I hear my like I'll hear myself echoing in something, and I'm like, who is that tiny child? <laughs> so, Danielle, I wanna um I wanna actually ask you now. Basement Collection comes out, and yeah. you you've been around for Ed's games. Oh yeah. But which which game do you find yourself most attracted to? Like, what which game do you do you enjoy playing? 
Out of the basement collection or ever or anything? The basement collection in particular. Oh. You could be honest. Oh, I, you know what I like to play the most? Gray Matter. Really? Yeah. No, that's I, the just... noise is so satisfying of like the glass breaking or whatever it is. Mm. Hmm. It's like a light bulb. I want to play Spewer, but I cannot. The controls <laughs> make me furious, and I can't get you're it trying right. To, you're trying to play it with your your touchpad on your laptop. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I tried it with the mouse too. It's horrible. It's just terrible controls. It's a horrible <laughs> game. Daniel likes one game I've done a lot, and then another game I've done she likes it pretty pretty okay. Yeah. Right. And that's Isaac and Meat Boy. Isaac is amazing. That's exact. It's exactly my kind of game. Scoop back. And anybody that likes Isaac is gonna like the new Seeker game. Like, you're just gonna, you're. you're oh gonna shit, guys! You heard it here first. When does next Isaac? When <laughs> does next Isaac? When does next Isaac? Yep. But I think I mean people really like randomness. They like surprises. Who doesn't like that? We love it. Yeah, um, my so my favorite game is Grey Matter. Uh, that's interesting. All right, that one's a good one. I've enjoyed that one. Um, now, I mean, there's a question for both of you guys, just, you know, to wind down a little bit. I mean, you know, maybe get a few questions from the chat, and you guys can say whatever you'd like. But um, basically, how was the how was the Melvins? Oh, God. Uh, can we tell the whole story? Please. Okay. Melvins was insane. Okay, so... Uh, as, should I just uh, recap the whole, like... Sure. I hate to use this word, but it was cray. <laughs> it was cray? <laughs> it was cray cray. Um, uh, uh... It was, well, it was so nuts. It was ridiculous. Well, you, 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 you want me to set up the beginning? Well, well, first I have to say that, you know, it's you that got us there. Mm. Yeah, thank you. There That's was a particular so. viewer that got you there. I forget who it was. You guys remember his name? Just give me a shout out. But, um, yeah, we, as a site, I'm we work together. I'm just going to give you the credit. Okay. It's fine. Well, who, whoever the... Vine, Vine Sauce as a whole. Yeah, Vine Sauce as a whole. The email written to Greg or whatever, the, the guy from Intacac, was, Greg. like, so articulate and worded so well. If it was me, I would just be like, huh, that's kind of important, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Need somebody? Yeah, so, so basically, uh... Greg and Mike, who run Ipecac, play games, and they were familiar enough with me to, you know, not write me off, um, and Greg was like, yeah, totally, you want to meet the Melvins, they're cool guys, and I was like, oh my god, I'm fucking shitting myself for a week here, because uh, I don't know what I'm going to say or do, I'm going to be a complete fool, and all that good stuff, but we finally get there, there was some chaos, because... It was like, I'm on the list. Oh, what list? Uh, a backstage list? Uh, well, we don't see you on this list. It was just like a lot of this. Well, the guy that needed stuff. to let us in was backstage, and no one could go backstage to get that guy. Yeah, but eventually we did. We, we made it in to go backstage. No, wait, wait. But before that, what? We're, we're like so excited because now we're in. The guy came out. We're walking back. We're walking in a straight line, and from uh, the right side, these two boys come around and go, Super Meat Boy, Super Meat Boy! <laughs> and we were just like, no, not, no, we're, ex no, you, as excited as you are, we are way more excited about something. <laughs> <you know. laughs> so yeah, we go backstage, and we walk by the room that Buzz is just sitting in with his glasses <laughs> on his laptop. You walked by it. Danielle saw him, and I like, ah. I stood frozen in the doorway. <laughs> so then there's the whole awkwardness of, like, how do I introduce myself and explain oh, who I am. And, like, the whole time I'm thinking, like, this is going to be, I'm going to look, always, I'm, how can you not look like a, 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 an idiot? Like, uh -huh. these people don't play video games. They don't know who I am. They don't fucking care. Like, I'm just a fan, and I'm going to look like an idiot and say dumb stuff. And I was prepared to, I was prepared for that. Okay. We had nothing to say. It was horrible. And uh, we went in, and... Uh, we just talked to Buzz and shot the shit. Basically, he talked about the the, the latest album and like yeah, well, he I made it. He had a song I liked. It. He got he jumped up and started playing. He's like, oh, I was at this Wings concert and this is here's the song. <laughs> yeah, he he went on and on a great length about the Wings cover and showed us like the actual cover of what version of the song that he was covering and it was just he was really 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 cool like really really laid back and Dale was also really cool and laid back. But, Dale Crover. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love Dale Crover, and uh, he was just—they're just fun, nice guys. They're so so super down to earth. And then I had asked, I showed um, Buzz like one of the latest 
plush things that I had made, and I said I would love to make Mel Melvin's plush. I wanted to make you guys, but I, I didn't have time to make you guys. And he goes, oh, yeah, you should you should totally do that. Just contact my wife. And I s said, yeah, I, would, I think I could get your hair perfect. And he's like, oh, no, no, don't make us. <laughs> <laughs> Like make Melvin's plush. I yeah, don't I don't know, know how it would. It'd just be anything. But he's into it. Yeah. Cool. And then and then so we're talking and whatever else and then Mike Patton walks in. Oh and my god. We're sitting in this tiny room. We're already feeling like we can't think of any questions and we know on the ride home we're gonna have the questions. Yeah, it was. Luckily, I'm pretty talkative, so I could fill in like a lot of awkward. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. For the most part, I just felt like I was like in the way. And I just wanted to be out of their way. I didn't Ed want to was, bother them. I was starstruck. I was. <laughs> we had, like, anime girl eyes. So, like, I, I shake, you know, Mike Patton's hand. He doesn't know who the fuck I am. Okay, but he, was, he, was, he came in. He's just standing in the doorway. He kind of looks like a normal person. Like, it's not like seeing Buzz Osborne and being like, hmm, is that a normal guy or is that Buzz Osborne? Right, right. <laughs> Like, Mike just kind of looks like he had a hat on. He had a uh, jacket. Just like, I kind of, who is I'm squeezing Ed's hand. Is it? Is it? That's yeah, he re he resembles like, like our, our brother-in-law. Brother yeah. Like his yeah. Anyway, so like that that tones down. He goes in the other room. I eventually go in and start talking to him and say, oh yeah, you know, you know, Greg got me back here. I'm Edmund Meat Boy, and he's like, oh Meat Boy. No. <laughs> he thought like, he was gonna be a total jerk, and I told Buzz, I said, I, I really want to get a picture with him, and he's like, good luck. So I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my god, he's, he's gonna be an asshole. But he was so nice. he was so nice. Like he was unbelievably nice, and like. He was just talking about video games, and then I sit down, and then I start talking to this other guy I'm sitting with. It turns out that he's one of the members of ISIS, and two of the members of ISIS were there, and I got to talk with... Oh, it was just... It was like it was like one of those episodes of, like, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons where they're doing the race, and, like, all the characters from all the different <laughs> cartoons are all in one place, and you're like, this is so cool! Oh, what is... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something race. I don't know. Wacky races. Like, it's the only Hanna Barbera like thing I ever liked because I always hated the individual. Characters. Yeah, yeah. Those, With Dick Dastardly cool. and Muttley. I, yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then we found out one of the guys that was just hanging out, and he ended up being the lead singer for the opening band. But I, I don't know what it is. But he is. Uh, he was one of the members of the Cows, I think. Yeah. Was yeah. the main guys from Cows? And I thought it oh. was. It was just. It was insane. It was just completely. Oh, insane. there was a guy who, if we were into sports, there was like the veteran player for the San Jose Sharks who I um, offended. Yeah, Daniel offended. <laughs> how did you offend him? <laughs> I asked him how big his wife's wedding ring was. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. He was Canadian. He's like French Canadian, so he's. He's like you're a professional athlete. Tell me about your wealth. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you have a douche haircut. You, you you seriously just bought the shirt you're wearing. It still has creases in the sleeves. Tell me how much your wife's ring cost. Yeah, I guess she thought she thought it was going to be like a crib situation. Yeah. It wasn't like you yelled it in front of everybody, too. You were standing right next to him and asked him. I like, legitimately like jewelry, and I wanted to hear about how Sure. There, there was something else going on there, though, where he thought that yeah, she knew everything about him, was, and I guess he yeah, was like, I, I, he Oh, was, I see. He, he, I think he might have been being traded yeah, or something. We Googled him on the ride home, and the things that come up is that he's possibly being traded, but he's, like, super old for hockey player, so maybe nobody, you know, wants him. Uh, yeah, we don't know. We and didn't, then, we didn't he, know anything about him. And then so-and-so cheats on his wife. Oh, no. <laughs> it's never good when you Google somebody's name, and that's what and comes, that up. comes up. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was, that was uh, awkward, um, but... You know, he, as you he do. wanted to fight me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's surprisingly small for a hockey player. I thought they would be bigger. Yeah, I could it well because he's in the skates. So he's taller. Yeah, he loves wearing the skates. I bet. <laughs> I feel. <laughs> but everybody else has them on. You think he wears them out? <laughs> oh man, we totally don't know who this person is, but I think they're a really big deal. They're kind of, yeah, he's a big deal. I I don't know. But um, it was fun. It was very, very, very fun. Yeah. We got the show. The show was fucking amazing. Then like they I wanted, watching. I wanted to bolt out of there because I'm like I'm, I bothered them too much. I can't, I can't hey, keep being in their way. We, we're, we're watching the show and who comes out and is standing by us? My cat. Oh yeah, we watched the show. He's <laughs> just standing next to us. Yeah, and we the most oh. surreal show is so at the end Danielle's the one who's like we gotta go backstage again. We gotta go backstage. And I'm like I don't want to bother him. Ed was was such a wuss. I was major wuss. At that point, I like I just didn't want to be a bother. Like I didn't want to be the guy that just stood around waiting to like talk to somebody. Um, I go back in though, and Mike Patton's there, and I guess I, either he like Googled me or something at some point, 
and he starts selling me to the Melvins. So like Dale and and uh, and Buzz are just standing there, and he's like saying no, like you should guys should do music for this guy's games. It's like what the fuck? Is oh going my on? god. And just looks like. Oh my, he looks like, I don't know, was, I, the face was priceless. It was completely nuts. And like the whole time, and then the whole ride home, I'm thinking, how can I make a game that the Melvins can do music for? I, mm. That would be really cool. I game around this somehow. But uh, yeah, like I could never, I'm like, I try to explain to Mike, I'm like, I, I, I could never do that because like I could never, I could never instruct, you know, my, my musical heroes on what I need for my game, you know, like, <laughs> fuck that, like, it was nuts. The whole thing was completely insane, and they were so nice, it was just really great. Yeah. Th thank was... you, thank you, Vine Sauce, and whoever that person is. And, and, and you were... Herpus and... McDerpus, it turns out, was his name. Um, uh, hey, a quick thing, really quick, check your Skype box, there's a picture of you with a bonnet. Um, oh. Someone drew, Zero Liquid. A very good local vine sauce artist. Come on in. Come on in. I'm looking svelte. Are we jiggling? Um, <laughs> and the question here is, um, this is a weird question. Can someone ask Ed if I can have permission to port Isaac to Android? I already have a working prototype. This... So, There's what? There's no way it's gonna run, guy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to spoil it for it's you. It's just an anon too. I don't even know who it is, really. <laughs> it's a whatever you think you're doing. Oh, it's probably. Yeah. It's, I bet it's Tony. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you think you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I bet you anything that's Tony trolling. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that. <laughs> he's he's trolled me in my chat before and made me extremely uncomfortable. Oh God. Okay, let's ask him. Um. Yeah. He keeps saying it runs fine, <laughs> with an exclamation mark. I don't know, is your mom? No. Who is it? I don't know. I do not want company. Who drove up? Who would be coming over here? I have no idea. Did you invite your mother over? Um, I'll go see. One sec. We sure. Might be no problem. Well, that, that's that's a problem. But I do not like cars, unexpected cars driving up. Yeah, no. I, I hear you. Don't um, play in my driveway. I'll tell you what, though. If you guys, you know, have unexpected company or whatever, um, by all means, we can... Oh, it's my sister. Okay. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm on my home. I thought you were Ed's mom or Jackie, and I was going to say that. I thought you were my mom. Oh, thankfully, it's just my sister. I texted you. Oh. I'm on my phone, man. Crystal doesn't even know she's live with millions. My sister has an even more crazy uh, child voice than I do. Oh, Hi. hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's you know you're you're live for not millions, unfortunately, few few millions, hundred. Millions, Crystal. Millions, sure. Um, but um, Ed, we can wrap this up now if you want. Um, oh, no need. Close my door. I'll be alone now. Leave you alone with your your cons cons conspiracies. Um, okay. So We're alone now. It's just me. And you. Oh, God. The, the men. Oh, it's getting tasty. Someone we drew talk, something else. Talk about boners now. Oh, oh, God. Ed, someone drew another thing. You're going to love this. Let me see. Oh, look. <laughs> They're quick. Yeah, they are. Um, I like these lines, too. Some good lines. You heard that. I don't know who drew that, but man, Ed likes your lines. Uh, dude. Also, I also like that you were going into detail on the dots on on the the, the, the outfit on the arm, but then you were like, ah, fuck it, I'm not going to do those dots on the other side. <laughs> uh, that was from QRN or uh, Dayton. That's his name. So thanks, Dayton. Um, so, Ed, what would you like to talk about? You have oh, you have an open forum. Uh, I don't know. What what are, Do people want to know anything? So let, yeah, let's do that. Why don't you guys ask a few questions and um, see? I'll try to filter through some of the decent ones. I, I've been doing a few levels of time fuck actually. I just got past the one where the keys are floating. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a second chapter that I actually made for for exclusively for the basement collection that has like a whole new take 
on okay. the whole game. It's pretty odd, and, and I, I wrote it in a day, um, so it kind of flowed really well, but I'm pretty pretty happy with it. And the puzzles are really hard. Like, really hard. I'm proud of how hard they are, because I thought some of those things were, like, I thought that I wouldn't be able to, like, jump right back in and make 33 new levels after, you know, God, how many? Three years, um, period, and then since I worked on it before. Sure. Um, I haven't reached those made, levels yet. I made 32. Tyler made one of the hardest levels. Okay. I'm already struggling a bit, so I, I'm right now I'm just <laughs> standing. I, I needed to just stand and, like, you know, look away. But it's it's good, though. I'm I'm almost done with the first... Um, Como se llama? What's it called? Whatever. The first uh, chapter, I guess. So, yeah. anyway, um, I, I actually have a question for you that was kind of interesting. How do you feel about S Steam Greenlight? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I love to talk about this thing. Is that I? Oh my god. Okay, number one, I'm gonna like just put out there how much I hate people again. Okay. So like, is this this goes with this? Like I I can't stand people. I can't stand you know victims and bitching. Okay. Like, especially you know having a really hard time getting to where I am. Mm -hmm. You know, and knowing the amount of work that has to go into, you know, to succeed in this, you know, fucked up reality that we all live in. Mm -hmm. um, being a victim and complaining about things gets you absolutely nowhere. It, Agreed. Not only does it get you nowhere, but um, it actually puts you back because it burns away your time and energy because you're thinking about how upset you are over this thing that's never going to affect you. But okay, that's my, that's my, that's the precursor to the conclusion. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Steam Greenlight. All right. Uh, sad spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. It was never the thing that anybody thought it would be. Okay. That's the reality. It was never, you know, you know, it was never the 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 chance that you thought you were going to have. The what they're offering you. It's it was it was always going to be a popularity contest. It was always going to be something that you not only had to make, make a really good game, but you also had to be really good at convincing other people that it was a good game, and then making sure that you could get the press to push it. Right. You know, that's that's the sad reality that it will always be. The stupid thing is the fact that anybody would have a problem with them putting a hundred dollar price tag on it because if you can't scrounge, you know, I don't care how poor you are, if you have this dream game that you believe in completely believe in and this is your end-all be-all like you believe in this game more than anything else and you know it's gonna get on Steam you know and, and this is your baby you can't ask somebody for money you can't ask five friends for twenty dollars you can't go take money out you know like I was poor like me me and Danielle were poor we 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 lived with roaches we lived with rats we lived in squalor you know, we've gotten financial aid because we're poverty line for years. And I entered my games in the IGF as much as I possibly could. And I paid $100 for each of them every single year. I didn't have that money. I had to work extra for it. I had to take more hours at GameStop. I had to do more bullshit work for, like, illustrations in different companies. I had to scrounge in order to do this yeah. or borrow money. $100 isn't much. A one-time fee of $100 isn't a realistic barrier of entry for anybody. It shouldn't, no, like, not at all. If you believe in what you do, and you believe you have a chance, this is the key thing, if you believe you have any remote chance of getting greenlit on Steam, $100 should be the, the least of your worries. Like, it's such a minimal thing for somebody who believes in something passionately and, and is realistic enough to know if, if their game actually has a chance. Like, that. that's... To my overall feelings of Greenlight. Now, the big picture too, and it's not to say that like Greenlight is bad because it's not bad. It is an improvement over their old system. It's like because of Greenlight, you know, more people are ha more people have a better chance of getting on Steam. Right. Before it was it was quite literally like you go and submit your game to Steam to one guy who plays it and says either you know I'm sorry it doesn't fit for our whatever, I don't know the excuse, there's like a line that they usually give, like, it, it doesn't fit in our, in, in Steam, basically, doesn't right. fit yeah. with games. Um, and they basically got so much of that, and like so many people bitching, like, 
there's this thing called the indie biz list, um, which a lot of it started out really small, a really like tight knit thing that a bunch of indies kind of got together um, to share business information so you don't get fucked because mm -hmm. it's really easy to get fucked over when you're an indie, especially it's it's harder now, but in the past it was really easy for larger companies to really screw you over. Like I almost lost the copyright of Gish when when this company was trying to do a PSP port, and like. It's a good place to like share i you know share ideas, share knowledge, you know share legal knowledge and and overall just share percentages so you're not getting screwed over mm -hmm. and it started as a really good thing, but as it grew, it became what a lot of indies called the indie bitch list, which was a place that everybody would bitch about the different rejections that they face sure. and it's like rejection is a reality like it's it's not something that you you, you don't give up because you 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 failed because you didn't get on steam like you know, if you believe in, in what you're doing, you, you release it regardless. Right. Like, and it literally came, like, people just bitching about the rejection that they faced all different places. And then the, the, the even worse aspect is, like, the majority of people um, on there, and this is going to sound harsh, but would just basically suck everybody's dick. And like, oh, it's okay. Your game's great. Like, sure, yeah. So, you know, and, and, and the sad reality is, most of those games weren't that good, and that's why they got rejected. But no one had the heart or the ability to say that, and it wasn't constructive, and it didn't give anybody anything. Like, it didn't help anybody. Like, like I don't know. But Steam Greenlight, the fact that it's there, it, it, it does allow more people to have a chance of getting their games on Steam because they've got a system set up that allows for it, even though it's a popularity contest. But realistically, like if you've got a really outstanding game and you've got a public demo and people know about it and you know you're willing to sacrifice, you know, a lot of hours in contacting press and really like making videos and, and, and just selling your shit, you got a you got a good chance. You, you do you have a much better chance than you did in the past. Right. Um, it's not an, the holy grail. Like it's not it's not the app store. You know, and, and it, that's a good thing. Like, if Steam was just full of a bunch of garbage, like, it would be really hard to find the good games, and it would become a joke, and everybody would undercut everybody, just like the App Store. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, Steam Greenlight isn't the greatest thing in the world, but it sure as hell isn't the worst. Um, you know, it's an improvement over what they had before, and um, barrier entry of $100, you got to be realistic. Like, if, if that's that much of a problem for you to complain about, you never your game was never going to get approved. Sure. Like it's just completely unrealistic. Like I just hate it when people like find other means of becoming a victim as to why they aren't where they should be. Like it's so easy to do that and it just is so hurtful to to any creative person to make excuses for themselves and not just man up and say I need to make a better game. You know, or I, I need to learn from my mistakes or, you know, Every game is a building block, and sometimes it takes forever to get to where you want to get, and sometimes you don't get there. But you have to, like, the key to it is enjoying the process. Like, I would still be making games, you know, I would still be making what I'm making now um, if I never made a Super Meat Boy and I never had money. I'd still be living in that shitty apartment um, with cockroaches and black mold, and uh, I probably wouldn't be as healthy, um, but... <laughs> yeah. I'd be just as happy because I love making games and that's what it's about for me. When you put money in the mix and you're like, you know, I'm only happy and I'm only considered successful if I've made profit and everybody plays my games, you're in for a world of hurt. You're in for a fucking miserable life. You gotta find, you know, ha happiness is, is definitely number one and uh, once you find that I think success is usually following you. I would agree with that. Um, with your success though, happiness has been, I mean, sure, a lot of things have been alleviated. You don't have to worry about you know, <laughs> this or that or that, but you're, you know, it's not like it was a happy switch. You know, I'm sure you go through your mood swings like anyone else does. I'm sure you have your bad days. And, of course. You know, and I think the basement collection is a testament to your hard work, um, where you mentioned, you know, building up this thing that you have for Steam Greenlight, and maybe it's not that great, and then the people tell you it's not that great, and it's like a little kid who doesn't, whose parents don't want to tell him that you know his work is shite, 
So he just keeps putting out crap and he doesn't learn. So in this case, when you put the hard work into it, and then you can make a basement collection, and you say to yourself, man, that was worth it. You know, all these games that I made, I didn't make to become famous. I didn't make to become rich. I made because I like doing what I do. And that's that's your point. And that's why I think the basement collection is so so fun to play and so interesting and, and like a, it's like a snapshot an interactive snapshot of a, of a guy's life and you know I, I know a lot of people on vine sauce have bought it uh, myself included obviously you 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 know were kind enough to drop me a, a copy but it's it's really it's really good advice from a really good spot you know what I mean yeah no I mean it's one of the reasons like I one of the things I hate about, you know, the, the the U.S. in general is the, they, one of the reasons why I don't really watch TV and cable television, I, I attempt to avoid it, like, we have this thing about us where we like to, like, push this lottery notion of, like, some people get it and some people don't, and, like, if you're fucked, you're fucked, and, you know, one day you might strike it rich, randomly, as long as you play, you know, it's this lottery mentality of, like, I want to do the least, least amount of effort possible and just hope eventually I'm going to roll that lottery number. Right. And, and it's a horrible, horrible, horrible way to go about life. Like, it's just bad. Like, it's, it's, it's setting you up to fail so hard and be so miserable for your whole life. Um, and, I mean, it makes sense control-wise. You know, you want people to feel that way. You want people to feel like one day they're just going to strike it rich. And Oh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Okay. Totally. Um but it's a very hurtful way of thinking. And uh, the one thing about the movie that I, I didn't like was this notion that to a lot of people who see it, even though the movie does go into pretty good detail of the fact that I've made a lot of games and I've you know, worked for you know, eight plus years before Meat Boy, um, a lot of people still come out with the idea that I made, that Meat Boy was my first game you know, and it sold a million copies and they could do it too. Like, and for the most part, I like the idea that people would have that kind of hope, but I hate that it doesn't fully explain the years of hard work and sacrifice that goes into something like that. Like, it tries to show that, but still people come out with the notion of, like, a lottery win. And, uh, and it, it doesn't help when something like, you know, Minecraft, which is great and much is great and everything, but it does kind of go with the whole, like, well... That was, you know, Notch's basically, you know, was known for his first game, you know, even though it wasn't. But everybody thinks it was. And he made a bazillion dollars. And, uh, you know, and then they get discouraged when they're, the game that they work on that they believe in doesn't make a million dollars or doesn't sell a shitload of copies. And, and it's horrible, and I wish you could somehow get rid of it and just go back to the basics and be like, you work fucking hard and you get repaid for your hard work. Yeah. It, comes back to you like just make sure that whatever you're working on already makes you happy and you can't lose like you can't fail you can never fail if the thing that you're working your whole life on makes you happy I don't know it's just a fucked up way of, of, of thinking everybody's money's on or money's <laughs> everybody's minds on money yeah. and and uh, that's what you know success is is, is all about money um, and all money does is make your life more complicated in, in a lot of ways like yeah. It's nice to have security, but realistically, I would be just as okay without this money. Um, you know, if, if anything, it just makes me want to lower the price of my games and, <laughs> right. and you know, care less about piracy and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I've just got, I've just got security. Um, it doesn't give you anything else. It really doesn't make you happy. It doesn't, doesn't fix any of those problems. The bad days don't get better when you've got money. Well, for me, I can say that the pursuit of money isn't really too much of an issue, or it wasn't. Um, I work part-time at a TV station, um, public access. It's, I, it's, sh it's shit. I make shit money. I worked, I worked in public access for, for two years. Really? Yep, I was a cameraman. Me too. <laughs> Wait, I'm, well, I'm a cameraman, and I'm an editor too, and, and you know, receptionist, blah, blah, blah. That's but just so, that's awesome. I mean, I love public access. Dude, like, uh, what the hell? <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we, we have some really bad shows. I was on a number of shows. Um, I'll tell you what, after this, I'll link you to a YouTube video of me doing a shitty public access television show. Like, and, honestly, yeah. like, if it wasn't for public access, public access, access Santa Cruz, um, I, I wouldn't have this kind of uh, independent creative mindset. Like, it was the fact that this place existed and I was around so many, you know, motivated creative people that inspired me to continue. Like, I don't know if I talked about this last time I was on, but I know I've talked about it before, but, like, the, the foundation that I'm built on independence-wise all came from a guest speaker who was a local artist who came into my school and um, he was an independent artist and nobody else in the class really gave a damn but this guy was like a god to me like he had everything I wanted he was in the Sick and Twisted Festival of Animation he had two shows of public access he had a syndicated comic strip and he had his own comics as well that he published and, and it was just like oh my god like I want this guy's life yeah. like, but he came out of the gate saying, you know, listen, I'm poor. You're not going to make any money really off this. You're, if you're lucky, you're going to make enough to get by, but it's really fun. And his name was Clay Butler. And i I just never been so in awe of somebody before. Like, in the flesh, this guy was like a hero. And I wanted his life. And he kind of took me under his wing, and he worked at Public Access, and he, he um, basically let me come in as a cameraman. And I, I had to go through all the training and stuff. And I worked with him for, like, about a year and a half. I worked on three different shows. Um, he had two shows, and then I also worked on, um, uh, it was a, a subsection called Queer TV. It was, like, a, a gay lesbian um, okay. sub-channel of public access, and I, and I worked on a few shows there as well. Um, uh, I, never got, I never got in front of the camera that much, but um, I, I was mostly observing and learning and um, being inspired by all these really creative people who weren't, who obviously weren't in it for the money because there wasn't really money to be had. Sure. But there was, there was just so much more there, and I was really young, and it was just so inspiring. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very inspired by unique creative vision and, and um, just that drive, like seeing somebody doing something um, and, and just burning through doing exactly what they want yeah it's just so greatly inspiring and that's the beauty of public access for me too <laughs> just going in I seeing mean, people do their yeah, shows yeah you, you also get the beauty of, of people who just have something that you'll never have like there's just certain people that have that creative genius that's a bit broken that's just so beautiful and it's never something that you can do and you just have to appreciate it for all of its bizarreness yes and it's something you can only really find on on places that allow for, you know, those types of people to be creative, you know, and have an outlet. We have um, a show that's very popular on Staten Island. It's called uh, Industrial Television, and it's um, these two guys. They call themselves the Two Droogies after the Clockwork Orange guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the the they're in their like fifties or whatever now, but they've had this cult following, and they just play an hour of the weirdest shit they find like snuff films you know like all this weird like independent television movies um and then they film skits with them talking about it reviewing it and being kind of generally nasty yeah and they go around and like do droogy like stuff but without and harming this is current like this is happening now still they've had this That's show for years 20 years almost and they're still doing it and they have a dvd box set out that no one buys but we we don't I'll care buy it. You give me a link to that, I'll buy it. Like I'm looking for this stuff. Like, oh, that's great. I, it's it's this is this is like, it's such a dying breed. It's such like an a '90s gem. Like the the '90s was just such an inspiring time for independence. Um, uh, you know, zines, independent television, and even mainstream television. You had shit like Liquid Television on MTV. Oh man, I love that. And show. like just tons of, of of different really cool animations. It was just like an inspiring time to be alive like music was amazing and everything else and uh... yeah it seems like i mean at least over here that shit died like and i'm in a, like a very progressive liberal creative town in santa cruz california like it's dead here oh. <laughs> like no one's doing shit no we still have it here man and we have um... terrible tim who does these horrible songs about people uh... but we love them like when i say horrible i mean he's just nasty and like dirty and vulgar the songs are great um, we, we've got a lot of people. Candy Sanders, the shitty karaoke. It's it, this is the heart <laughs> of of my life. Like I, this is what I do for a living. I encourage these people, and I, that's why I love my job. And Jay Miller, yeah, we have Jay Miller. Um, 
But the thing is, I love my job. I don't get paid a lot. I make 12 bucks an hour. I work five hours for five days a week. I, yeah. I live at home. I don't care. I have vine sauce. I have that. And I don't care if, if I have enough money to last the rest of my life. As long as I can do what I do now for the next 20 years, I'm great. I'm golden. So that's Sadly, to, to, the, the link you gave me doesn't work. To droogies.com? Yeah, no. -uh. Um, oh, it works for me. That's weird. See over here too, like um, one of the 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 an, a huge huge inspiration on me when I when I was young, there was a show called Fishmasters, and it was a Bay Area only show. That oh wait, it loaded now. Okay. I guess it's just really. The the link great. above that, by the way, is you in a bonnet again. Oh, I did see that. Okay. Good job. Yes. Um. Yeah, there's a show called Fishmasters, um, which was an early '90s show that actually went on at 1 a.m. on one of the one of the more popular like um, uh, it was like channel 8 or whatever like KSBW 8 mm -hmm. um, and it happened to like it was like a fluke where the, he, they pitched the show to um, KSBW because they worked there and then they ba basically like let them put their show up after Saturday Night Live at 1 in the morning and um, they were gonna pull it but it turned out to have like higher ratings than anything else um, and then it became like this really cult, this cult hit, but it was like super, super, it was super low budget, super low budget, like public access, but put together kind of show. And like, I would stay up every Saturday and watch that and then record it. And like, it felt like it was being broadcast into my home specifically. And it <laughs> yeah. was just for me. And I, I, I guess I was just kind of blessed with all these really cool creative things when I was young growing up that really kind of got this thing in my head of, of how how awesome it would be to have the freedom to say and do what I want and an audience for to listen sure you know, that's that's all I wanted like and uh, I mean, it's a huge honor to be able to have that I mean it's, it's amazing you do man and I, I want you to know too directly you can speak to you know me and you know people are hearing you right now so you I mean I have the same thing to some smaller extent but if you ever want to hop on the site you have something you want to say that's kind of what we're here for as well so I know how you feel and the inspiration continues you just have to look for it you can never become so jaded you know I, I don't have cable I don't have cable television I don't look at America American Idol America's Got Talent or all you know really like these shows these superficial Jersey Shore things because I, I hate them, and as, as a result, I don't pay for cable. I make my own TV on the internet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, me, yeah, me and Danielle, like, once we, were, we figured out the cords we needed to buy in order to hook up our computer to the television, we haven't had, I, I think it's been eight years since we've had cable. That's smart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there wasn't anything on television either way, though. No. Like, the only thing I, the only, the only thing I miss, um, or missed, was Judge Judy, which I love. So much. <laughs> we all no love fun. Judge Judy. <laughs> Judge Judy, God, that woman is amazing. If I, if I wasn't married to my, my wife, I'd marry her. She's a genius. <laughs> I love her. But Judge Judy, uh, I'm a fan of Maury. Like, I like all the really terrible, horrible stuff. I have, I'm like a, I'm, I'm a weirdo when it comes to that. Like, all the things that I really don't like about the United States, I revel in the sickness. Yeah. Like, like I, I also collect like religious propaganda. Like I like I don't know. I'm like I'm even on like a, um a, a you know what chick tracks are? No. Um, you've I'm sure you've seen them. They're religious book like pamphlet comics. Okay. They're like yeah. Rectangular. They're they're all over the world. There's millions of them everywhere. It's okay. a huge thing. And they're all written by this lunatic, um, who's a genius in his own right like he's a great artist but he's a horrible horrible human being um and i also subscribe to his newsletter which is like totally right-wing extremist shit what's like prepare for war like get your guns because the socialists are taking over like i don't know i like i love i love i love i love the stuff that i hate i guess i don't know there's there's something there that like intrigues me like i i I'm interested in how horrible things can be. Well, it's um, it's like 
having two tickets to the freak show in a, in a way, you know, because you... Yeah, no, it's, it totally, it totally is. Yeah. And, yeah, there are some, there's a plethora of freaks out there who don't even realize it. It's true. Um, I, I have a video for you, by the way. Someone wanted me to link you. It's a video of Isaac Portable. Okay. Yeah. Let's so, not see this. You know, I don't know what's going on with this. It says, um, after figuring out how to extract the SWF file... From Isaac's EXE, I was able to shoot it to my friend. Um, what is? I don't know what he's playing on. If someone can get me into contact with Ed and Florian, maybe we can work something out to do an official release. Like, okay. I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but the chat's been linking. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Everybody should look at this video and sh see how it fucking runs. Good God, like it's five frames a second or less. Yeah, no. No, I knew that I know this is possible. Like you can run emulators for 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 SWFs in this, but the whole problem is 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 running it in, at a speed that is actually playable. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm seeing what you're saying. It's it's horrible. Like it is completely unplayable. I mean, it's cool that you could do that, but like like come on. Like uh, you know, every programmer does know that this is possible. Now, you know, it's very cool that you, that you did this and everything, but no, like in order in order for for Isaac to actually be on a on, on this platform, it has to be completely remade, um, and uh, which is you know happening. You know, we'll, I, there's no doubt we'll test it on 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 iPad and stuff and see if it is um, sure feasible, um, you know, and comfortable. I still really do not like the you know kind of controller layout in, uh, in this sort of stuff. Spies that can't kind of stand thing. it. But it's one of those things where, like, remake-wise, if all goes well, um, it's the publisher's investment. So if they can make it work on whatever system they want to make it work on, um, I'm all for it. It's their fucking investment, you know? Like, they're, they're the ones that are investing their time and money in, in re rebuilding this game from scratch. So, I, you know, they're entitled to... Get it to work on whatever, and uh, if it if it works, I'll uh, I'll sign off. Good answer. Um, but yeah, it looks cool. Yeah. Like I'm, I don't want to diss the person for the effort they obviously put into doing this. Very cool looking, um, but that does not gonna that's not gonna fly. Like <laughs> yeah, like, I was the game runs like shit already. Like I don't want to take it down even further. Understood, man. Understood. Um, how much? No, that's a bad question. Um, I guess, um, well, the, the, honestly, the most common question I've gotten, Ed, was, before this interview, was, um, would you include a Vine item in a future game of yours? That, that seems to be what's on everyone's mind. A, a Vine, um, your, your guy's logo is like the, like a Mario Vine, right? It, well, it's any kind of Vine, really. Any kind of Vine. We'll see. So there you go, guys. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's just an abstract concept, but honestly, just you doing the interview is good enough. But it's something that people were kind of interested in. You know, like a vine item in Isaac or something. But next question. Yeah, I mean, I got if 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 the remake happens, I've got to come up with like eighty plus new items. So you never know. There you go. Um, when does next Isaac? No, that's a shitty question. Any other <laughs> questions, guys? Um, when does next Vine Sack? All right. This has been uh, a very interesting chat. Uh, we won't keep you too much longer, but um, let's see. Okay. Good question. Ed, this, this is a very good encapsulating question. All right. Would you, how do you feel about playing The Binding of Isaac on Steam's new The Big Picture mode? How do you feel about that? I, you know, I feel horrible. I'm out of the loop because I've been actually working a lot with Tommy on what we're working on now. I don't even know what that is, but it has something to do with GamePad or something, doesn't it? Right. It basically, what it is is um, it's like Xbox 360's dashboard, but a Steamified version of it. Very simple. Oh, so it's it's them saying uh, "fuck you, Ouya." Pretty much, yeah. Where you can, <laughs> I, like, That's funny. I have my um, HDMI cable from my computer to my TV, so. I can be on my couch, and I can get my gamepad, and I can browse through my Steam games. There's an internet browser, and I can actually play Isaac from my couch. Like, nice. a, yeah. So, does that sound something? Does that sound appealing to you? 
Yeah, I mean, it need, would need controller support, and sadly, it's not possible. So there you go. I actually didn't know. I haven't tried it, but yeah, I, I played Counter Strike Global Offensive with it, and it was awful. You know, against people yeah. who knew how to play. But uh, <laughs> let's see what else. I don't know. I really. I guess that's about it. Um, here, I got one more. One more good question from the chat, and this is: um, Is Tommy the one doing the work for Binding of Isaac remake? Is it Florian or is it some random third party? I mean, it's is a it's a third party company. They're they're very skilled and very good and have a good track record. Um, I'll I'll be able to announce it soon, but I have to hold off because I believe I'm announcing it in the game dev post mortem. So something to look forward to, I guess. Sure. Um, um I'll, yeah, I'm gonna you know break out the details of exactly what what's that what that's all about, and then hopefully by then I'll I'll be able to announce officially if this is really happening. We're waiting on a few yeses. If you, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, we, we need we need to know, like they're they're basically budgeting out their time and, and, and trying to figure out what, if this is gonna happen, you know, how can we make it worth it? Because, you know, a lot of a lot of platforms don't make a lot of money, and these guys would be investing a lot of money in this remake, um, so they need to make their money back, so they need to make it worth it. So they're looking into all the all the avenues of release. And once they get a few more yeses, um, which is looking pretty good, um, we'll be able to officially announce something. And hopefully, if, if it's a no, uh, not that many people will be let down. Because hopefully not that many people know what's going on. But you never know. Okay. Um, well, I guess that's about it. Um, I don't really... I really don't have a whole lot more. I just want to let you know I've been enjoying the basement collection. And thanks again. Um working my way through time fuck I'm almost done with the first area or the first uh, chapter uh you know Ed it's always great you've in the same way I want you to picture this you go to see the uh, the Melvins and you get to meet Mike Patton and and Dale Crover and all these guys and um it's hard to get a, a feel for what to say in in a same in a similar situation in a similar way it's like that with me to talk to you. Well, I I don't. <laughs> I'm not putting you on the same level as like a, a rock star, but yeah, please don't. No, 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 I'm not. But it's it's kind of a strange thing. Like you're a busy guy, and you're a guy who does a lot of work, and you're always, you know, doing something, and um, you don't know how much of a pleasure it is, and you know how much of a scary thing it is too for me to get a chance to talk to you. So I want to thank you for everything and for kind of being a friend. Oddly enough, you've you know you've been like a really nice guy to me, and uh, I, I appreciate that. So that's not a problem. It's like I said, like it's hard to find genuinely nice people, and I think you're a genuinely nice guy, and I'm willing to you know give give you what you need. Um, and I I I, I appreciate. How I mean, you ask good questions. You seem like a down-to-earth guy, and you know, I'm more than happy to come on here and talk whenever, whenever, whenever you need. Um, it's totally cool. Like you, you've, you've given me more. I feel for me, you've given me more than, than I've given you. Like you, you know, all, all. I mean, all realistically, all the fans have given me a great deal. But it's it is it's hard to find genuinely nice people nowadays. There's a lot of assholes out there. A lot of horrible people and. Yeah, it's good. Good to know there. There's good ones, and I'm more than happy to uh, to to do whatever. Sure. Well, the same goes for you, man. Um, and the community is very grateful. You are actually doing a lot more than you'd imagine. You're giving time for them more than me. So, um, you know, keep keep making the games that you make that you love to make, and um, you know, we'll we'll keep we'll keep playing them. And uh, it's just, you know. Anytime you get something that you're on, that's on the horizon and you want to promote it a little bit, um, I'll, I'll send you a message and maybe you stop by and say hello. I'm totally fine with that. Cool. Like, it's it's stuff like this that gives me hope because, in all honesty, like like I, I think I said last time about like pruning, taking myself away from the internet because of how damaging it can be because people are horrible. Yeah. For the most part, I've done a really good job at that and I felt much better and been more productive since, but. Every once in a while, I'll get the wild hair to actually check, you know, Twitter and stuff like that, which which I've been good at not checking, which 
for anybody who's following me, like, I'm sorry, like, I don't, I don't ever look at this at me stuff. Like, it's very rare because I found that I'm better off if I don't look. Um, and it's not a slight to anybody else other than the fact that there's high probability that somebody's going to link me to something that's upsetting. And uh, recently I've seen a few upsetting things. And uh, it's painful, but I'm, it's, I'm learning to deal with idiots. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, it's, it's just one of those, like, being okay with people being dumb and being ignorant and saying stupid shit and and uh, it, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's 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 an isolated incident for the most part where someone basically made a video called "Let's Hate Edmund McMillan," which somebody, a couple people linked me to on Twitter, and I mistakenly clicked. Um, and it's just this person going into great detail about how I'm a misogynist and um, going through my games and explaining how and. Uh, which it doesn't fare well for me because I made a game called Cunt, <laughs> and that can be taken very go very bad, <laughs> you know, if if looked at in that light. And um, I saw it, and I initially thought it was like a joke um, because it seems so over the top. And then I realized it wasn't, and I went out of my way to contact this woman um, to in an attempt to explain that you know the information that she has you know may may seem to make sense. And I mean, you can already tell where I'm going with this. Like, yeah. this person had their mind made up before they even knew who I was. Sure. It was, it was set in stone. And I'm so stupid that I thought that I might be able to explain myself to this person or that they even cared. You know, that's where I'm stupid. You know, that's where I made the mistake. And I invested, you know, a good amount of time in, in attempting to explain to this person that, you know, these are the reasons behind this, this, and this. And you know, <laughs> like it's just painful. Like I've, I've to be accused of something. Like being accused of being a big when you're you you're so not. <laughs> of course. Like it, it's it's annoying. And um, and then what happens is they get upset, and then you know I get upset, and then they inspire more idiots to do more dumb shit um, that's misguided and wrong. And and then it just goes around and around. And I'm learning more uh, how to avoid this, but the sad fact is what I'm learning is to just completely remove myself from a lot of it. And I try to keep myself accessible for things like this. You know, specific things that hopefully enough people hear and are informed of so these dumb conspiracy theories don't float around everywhere and convince people that people that you know, that all these different people are a certain way. Like you it's just retarded because it's like we fucking make video games, but there's so many video game designers that have these bizarre conspiracy theories around them. Like, I've heard some crazy shit about John Blow that it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, and it's just crazy how that stuff, you know, grows in the comment section of, you know, websites. And I, I, I like to be able to have some sort of voice to, to inform these people of, of how they might be wrong, but the reality is, I have to deal with the fact that it doesn't fucking matter. I shouldn't be looking at it, and you know, at the best, for the most part, the the fans usually come in, and when people have the right information, they'll inform them. But I just got on this like trip of feeling like what the core of what's wrong with a lot of our society right now is that. The people, the the people who who are educated in certain areas, um, won't put any effort into explaining things to people who don't have that information. Instead, they just write them off as idiots, and they don't put any effort into giving them the information that they might actually use. And I thought that I might be able to do that in this situation. I thought I might be able to put some information out and put some something out there. And I thought I, I don't know. There still seems to be some validity to that like I feel like people should put more effort into explaining why somebody's insane conspiracy theories are wrong sure but it's just too easy to write them off as nuts and no one you know and then they they run rampant and convince all these other people that uh, you know <laughs> God created the earth 
at the same time as dinosaurs. Yeah, and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, oh my God, you're telling me I just had an argument today about that. Um, but I, I really want to um, just let you know. I mean, it starts here. I, I've, I've had some things too. Like, um, luckily, I have a voice that I can, you know, every night I go live, I'm able to talk to people, and, and if, if they have a problem, you know, I address it. But in a situation where you're making video games, it would almost seem slightly narcissistic if you're using one method or another to just, you know, dispel every little theory that pops up. So, in which case, I would say you really, in your situation, you're, you're in a bit of a more unique position than I am. Um, but in your, your case, I would say something like this, where you just hop on a site like this, you have a few hundred people. They're informed. Okay, I got it. Ed's this kind of guy. And then they just go out and, you know, take care of it. That's kind of really all you can do. Um, and yeah. then, you know, then there's like the musicians <laughs> who would read all the reviews that they got. And then they would go nuts from that. And yeah. it's like a fine line between too much and too little. And um, I can imagine that being very difficult. I don't know what it's that's a, like. It's, a, it's, an, it's a bizarre balancing act. I have... I believe I'm learning. It's taken so many years, but I believe I'm learning and I'm figuring out a lot of... The, the basic logic that I put to it is that uh, it's none of my business what people think or say about me. It's none of my business. I'm so goddamn fucking sick of hearing about myself at this point. Like, I don't care and I shouldn't care, but there's still that little broken animal part of me that, like, wants to know, you know, what's behind door number two. Sure. And um, it's that mystery that always catches me in, 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 in a trap. And, like, for the most part, though, I think I'm getting pretty good at it. And, like, I don't look at anything anymore. I don't have Google Alerts anymore. I don't even know. Like, people, shit will go up and happen. And someone will lie on me and say, oh, did you see this, you know, this review that you got? It was really cool. And it was from, like, two months ago, and I didn't know about it. Um, and I think that's the way it kind of should be. Like, if something is significant enough for me to care about, somebody's going to... You'll hear about you know, it. I'll hear about it. It's, and, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I've learned, I've learned to kind of remove myself from it for the most part, but, God, you know, we're just really broken. You know, it's, it's totally, an, it's a the purest example of, of yeah. AVGM. Like, I want to flick the switch because what's going to appear? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Could be, could be a complete waste of time, and most likely it is, but there's just that broken part of me that wants to do it. Um, because what if it's significant? <laughs> well, it's like this, man. Um, you know, they say anything that you might need to hear from the news, you'll hear anyway. So don't it's watch true. the news. That's, that's very, very true. Yeah. And that's and the news is a horrible thing to usually sure. get away from. Like, yeah, if someone's blowing up the World Trade Centers, you'll find out about it right away, regardless of you knowing the news or not. Sure. But if not, you're just going to think the world's coming to an end because all the news tells you is horrible, horrible shit. Yeah. And, and guys, I hope you're listening. I hope you learn a little bit from this. Um, you know, this, is, this isn't this is just like me interviewing a guy about his video games. This is like, you know, I'm 27, Edmund's a bit older, and he knows what he's talking about. And really... No, here's, here's, the, here's the key, and this is important. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to figure it out. Nobody knows what they're talking about. No one has any answers. I'm just trying to figure it out and trying to make sense of this fucking chaos that we're all just being thrown through and uh, the one thing I've learned is that nothing is black and white no one is exactly right no one is exactly wrong um, it, uh, minus the case of dinosaurs and humans <laughs> right exactly <laughs> but, but even in that case but even in that case I can understand why religion is there and why it's important for some people to believe in and why some people need it in certain points in time, it's fine. You know, it's just when it gets abusive and discriminatory and sure. s segregates people, that's when it gets bad. But, you know, it's, I think it's just important to just, you know, know, know that you, you aren't right and you don't know it all and you're not perfect and there's all these things to improve on. And, and, uh, that's and I'm not, I don't know, I'm, dude, I'm fucking... 32 years old, I don't know shit. <laughs> Just trying to figure it out. Uh, that's better than I could have put it, and that's more than I could have said. You you have a lot of backbone for saying that. 
and, and uh, again, you know, the ego thing here, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, you're probably sick of hearing about yourself, but really you are, a, you're a good dude. And uh, I thank you for the time you've spent. I thank you for the advice. And um, really, you kind of gave me a little bit today. You gave me a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take home. I'm gonna take away from this. Specifically, when, what am I doing with my life? Kind of thing. And work, you know, work harder. I will definitely, definitely remember a lot of this stuff. And um, I don't know, man. I, I get, I don't. I, get, I don't get good in these situations. I'm usually really good at this stuff, but right now I'm, I'm all kind of choked up and I don't know what to say. Thanks. That's really all I can say. No no problem at all. Thanks for having me on. Anytime. It's always... It's, it's good. You know, just, just like I was talking about games being a conversation and me trying to figure stuff out, like, the only person... You know, I have two people that I talk to, my wife and Tommy, and, and you know, sometimes having somebody else to talk to... Um, it helps me realize things, you know. You get, you talk about stuff, and you, it's good. It's good to, it's good to actually interact with people. I have a hard time with it, but it's good. It's good. It's healthy for everybody to do. Um, it's, it's not good to be locked in your, in your mind, and, you know, convince yourself that the world's ending. Because right. It's pretty to do. Or, or about the dinosaurs, of course. But <laughs> yes, of course. All right. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks very much for having me on. It's uh, again was an honor, and um, I'm more than happy to repay the. The amazing gifts um, you and your 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 t your team of, of everybody have bestowed upon me and Daniel. So sure. no problem at all. All right, man. Well, you have a good night, and uh, I look forward to our next chat whenever that may be. And um, totally, maybe soon. Maybe Tommy will be with me. That would be great. And yeah, let him know if he ever wants to hop on himself. I mean, I would love to have him as well. Totally. So uh, yeah, man. Thanks again, and um, I. I Tell Danielle I said goodnight as well. And uh, everyone here is rooting for you. Just remember that. All right, thanks. All right, take care, Ed. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. So, uh, wow. <laughs>